Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Up today it is a brand new steam locomotive from Oxford Rail. <laughs> Oxford's last brand new steam locomotive, the N7, was a huge success. It was a very high quality model with some excellent performance, beautiful details, and to top it all off, a fantastic price to go with it. So I'm hoping Oxford's brand new steam locomotive, that is this one, the J27, will have much of the same hallmarks. Now, detail, quality, performance, all of that still remains to be seen, but the price tag certainly is in line with Oxford's other models. An amazing price on this. So the RRP is £109.95, and the lowest I've seen this available from the retailers is at £86.50. And in fact, I bought mine from Derails Models for that price. £86.50. Now, after the year or two that we've just had with the virus and such, many manufacturers would have us believe that prices have necessarily had to skyrocket. And then Oxford Rail release a brand new tender locomotive for way less than £100. <laughs> I just love that, that's brilliant. So yeah, after the D-Class at £200, this ought to be a refreshing change, but... But, I mean, I could knock up a J27 on my 3D printer for much less than £100, but that isn't to say it will be any good. So today we're going to look at this very, very closely. We're going to figure out whether it's worth the money. Surely it will be. And we'll see what makes this loco tick. So come with me on this journey. Let's find out. Okay, the J27. So we're talking 060 tender engine from the LDR. This loco is going to get a companion because Oxford Rail are also producing the J26, which in real life was a slightly earlier version of the same design. Comment below if you'd like to see me review that. But at the moment, this is the only one available from Oxford. There are going to be several different J27s, also J26s. None of those are in stock yet, though. So if you want to see the version I have, I'll show you the end of the box. So mine is OR76. It's the J27001. Initially, I had 004 on order, I think, which had some lovely lining on it, but that isn't in stock yet, so I've, I've gone with this one instead. It is the J27 LNER, and it's number 1010. Nice, neat running number there, as you can see. And I'm pleased to say that we're able to get this out straight away because there's nothing else really to see on the box. So the £86.50 tender locomotive, what is this going to be like? Let's find out. Now Oxford Rail, generally speaking, are really, really good. Their last few models, at least, have been absolutely superb. And so hopefully this one will be as well. Now the sleeve kind of started to come apart on me, so we've already got the accessory bag coming off and we've got some foam to help package the Loco too. That's pretty good. But first we'll take a look at the operation and maintenance instructions. Apparently this is an 062T N7 locomotive. <laughs> yep, frayed not Oxford, that was your last loco. Why don't these manufacturers proofread their paperwork? It's embarrassing. Anyway, there's a brief history of the loco. Pause it if you want to. It is the interesting part on the inside. So what have we got? Fitting, brake rigging and coupling. Oh, that's all fair enough. Running in, period, and locomotive lubrication. What are they recommending for running in? Uh, it doesn't seem to say, it just says that you need to do it. So that'll be 30 minutes in each direction. Now we've got removal of locomotive body and DCC socket location, <laughs> which funnily enough, does not appear to show how to remove the locomotive body, only the tender body. So I will have to investigate that myself, I reckon. And then on the back, hints and tips. Very, very Hornby-esque, isn't it, this? Okay, well, that's fair enough. More on that a bit later on then. So let's take a look in the accessories bag here. Now look at this. It looks like we've got a full set of fireman's tools inside there. I can see a shovel and some pokers and stuff. How many locos come with that these days? And yet this one is so inexpensive. And look, there are also some three-link couplings included. Well, the Dapple D-Class didn't even have anything like that. And that was £200. It appears there's also an alternative drawbar inside there. So maybe that one will allow closer coupling, possibly. Right, come on then, let's see what this is like. So am I expecting any die cast? Well, usually not for this sort of price, but then again, the Oxford N7 was really inexpensive. 
and that was almost entirely made of metal. I just don't know how they do it, or rather, I just don't understand how other manufacturers can get away with not doing it for the prices they charge. Okay, so first things first, I can see that the chimney is not connected. It came off when I opened the blister pack and caught my eye, so is that gonna sit back on there nicely? Or is it going to require glue? Not a good sign, is it? I mean, it's, it's an inexpensive loco, so we can forgive it one or two little things, but um, yeah, if it's too fragile, that won't be good. Anyway, I think it's balanced. So, the finish looks okay, doesn't it? There's a slight hint of satin to the body. Not an awful lot, but I would say it looks fine. It doesn't look too plasticky. Let's feel it. I think it is plastic. I think it is, but that's okay for the price. Let's lift this out then and take a close look. Okay, there it is, the J27, and doesn't it look nice? Yeah, this is absolutely lovely for what it cost. It is quite heavy, it must be said, and that's because there is a die-cast running plate on this Loco. Doesn't look like it's straight, which is a pity. I'll have to get my ruler on that to confirm later on. But still, it gets some points for the die-cast. Overall, this looks lovely, and I can see a number of nice features on it already. So, fingers crossed, this will be a good Loco. First of all though, here's a little bit of history on the things in real life, and then we'll take a close look at this and I'll show you some of the details. So the J27 dates back to 1906 when the first examples were introduced to the Northeastern Railway as a Class P3. Designed by William Worsdell, the class was based on the slightly earlier J26, as I say, and it was intended for hauling long freight trains. The design consisted of two inside cylinders, 180 psi boilers, a loco weight of approximately 50 tonnes, and a tractive effort in the region of 110 kilonewtons. 115 examples were built in total, but over several batches and over many years. The final build's not actually taking place until 1922, so they were in production for a long time. The class was eventually withdrawn, like all Steam Loco classes, and only one example remains under preservation. So there she is, the Oxford Rail J27, up close and personal for you. And actually, considering what this model cost, I think it's absolutely phenomenal. The quality of it actually surpasses quite a lot of far more expensive models that I've seen in the past. So, right off the bat, I have to say the warping of the running plate is far less extreme than I thought it was going to be. In fact, if I hold my steel ruler up to it, you might not even be able to see any warping there. There's a tiny bit, but it's almost unnoticeable to the point where I'm actually surprised I was able to notice it just with the naked eye. I think it must have just been illusion. So I would not say that was a problem, thank goodness. The weight of the locomotive because of that die cast running plate, loco and tender is 236 grams, which is heavier than the 200 pound Dapol D-Class. Keep saying to yourself folks, 86 pounds 50. It's a little bit more than the Hornby J15, which is a slightly smaller loco, but that did have an entirely die cast body. So the weight of the model is absolutely fine. And don't get me wrong, the model is not perfect. I've got to do a repair to the chimney because as you can see, all I've got to do is touch it and it comes off. The wheels to me do not look right. As you can see, the axles are exposed and they haven't been blackened. At some point, I'm pretty sure Oxford said that that was going to be fixed and that the wheels would look a lot better. Well, either I'm mistaken or they changed their minds on that because the wheels do not look great on this. However, yet again, I've seen far more expensive models than this whose wheels were no better. And also, if you look at the boiler, you can see there is a sort of parting line that goes right through the boiler and also the smoke box as well, and that's on the other side. Looking at the photos of the real thing, I can't see anything like that on them. There's also quite a dramatic change in finish where the plastic body meets the die cast underside of the boiler, which is presumably part of the chassis, but that's in a very, very awkward place to see and it's almost entirely unnoticeable. So I suppose it's a little bit cruel to even mention that. But these are relatively minor gripes, aren't they, at this price point. For £86.50, this Loco has a lot of features that I really like. Now, the decoration on this particular version is very simple because there's no lining or anything, but some of them are going to have lining and those are no more expensive. But even on this version without the lining, you can see the decoration on the side of the cab is absolutely fine. You've got the running number, which is nicely applied. Over the centre splasher, you've got a nicely printed builder's plate. I assume it's a builder's plate. I'll get a close-up so you can see. 
The buffer beam, particularly on the front of the Loco, is beautifully decorated. Look at that, you've got all the text on there, no paint going astray anywhere. It looks really, really great. Let me show you the cab. Look at this cab. Now, it doesn't have individually glazed windows or anything, even though they do look perfect from the outside. But look at that, all of the different components are painted, some of them are separately fitted, even the gauges have got little details on them. That's really, really good cab. Just keep saying, like seriously, £86.50, £86.50. The roof of the cab has got metal whistles. Look at those whistles. How many times have we seen awful cheap looking whistles on Locos that are far more expensive than this? Really, really like this thing. And look at the finish on the body under the lights. It looks even better, doesn't it? There's a real sheen to it. Not too plasticky at all. I think that's really quite impressive. The model's got quite a few nice separately fitted parts. You've got all of the handrails, which look nice and straight. That's really good. A few little bits and bobs fitted to the running plate. The reverser over on the other side, I believe that is just made of plastic, possibly. Not the most convincing piece in the world, but at least it's there. Underneath the boiler, you've got this lovely area of daylight. I mean, that's a very, very convincing little effect right there, isn't it? I like that a lot. And there's even a representation of the valve gear between the frames, which has also been painted up. Wow, what a premium feature that is. And there is the smoke box, very unusual shape to this smoke box. I do quite like that. And the same was true of the N7, actually. I must give it to Oxford. They choose some very interesting looking steam locos, don't they? But again, it's got all of the usual details on it. Above the buffer beam, you've got the lamp irons, which have been separately fitted, I think. And then you've got these metal sprung buffers. Look at that, sprung buffers. You've got pre-fitted hooks on the buffer beams that you can put those three links into if you want. There's even a little hole so that you can put those in. Real nice attention to detail. And as you can see, the coupling rods do look really nice and fine on this. Despite the wheels not looking the greatest, the rods themselves are absolutely fine. I think that's more or less it for the Loco. Anything else I've missed? Here's a little look at the safety valve arrangement. Quite a nicely moulded piece, that. And then you've also got the separately fitted tender four plate, which is made of metal and it does appear to be movable, which is cool as well. Let's take a look at the tender then. Again, this is a very, very nicely produced tender. You've got the l &E art on the side, which is perfect. I mean, that's Hornby Backman quality, really, really good. The underframe is nicely detailed as well. You can see we've got the metal wheels. You've got the brake rigging, which has been pre-fitted and it was also fitted to the Loco as well. So you haven't got to do that. I love that. You've got this coal guard across the top, which is nicely molded. And around the back where the water filler cap is and such, you can see that there are little gaps in the guard as well, which is quite a bit of complexity on a molded piece there. And then inside the top of the tender, you can see there is a very, very small coal load, which I don't believe is removable, but the level of that coal is low enough so that you could put your own coal load, crushed coal, whatever you please, in above that, and it would look perfectly acceptable. So there's no need for it to be removable. And then in the front, you can see we've got some little controls for the crew and also a little holder, I think, for the tools that were included, which I think is also made of metal. And then around the back, you've got some more separately fitted handrails, lamp irons, more sprung buffers. And then front and back, the Loco has these NEM tension lock couplings fitted and they seem to be fine. Not much movement on them. I think it's just one of those NEM pockets with a slight springiness to it. But I think that should be absolutely fine given the wheelbase of the tender. So it has one or two very, very minor areas of crudity, and perhaps those that know more about the prototype might be able to spot a few inaccuracies that maybe I can't. But overall, for what you get, the quality and the level of detail, as per usual from Oxford Rail, is absolutely superb, and in many ways surpassing the level of many other manufacturers most of which charge far more than this for their models. So I'm pretty darn happy with this so far, but we still have to get a look at the mechanism and we still have to test this out. So there's still time for this all to go horribly wrong. Fingers crossed it won't do. Let's take a look and let's find out. So there she is then, the brand new Oxford J27 down onto the track, ready for the first test. And I've got to say how fond I am of this Loco already. I think there is a tendency for the plain black 060 tender engines to look a little bit boring and nondescript, but because of the slightly unusual shape and proportions of this model, I'm actually not finding that at all with this. I'm actually a big fan of this already. Although, I don't know, maybe I'm being influenced here by the sheer high quality of the mechanism in this one. Very, very impressed, folks. So I've already said it's 236 grams loco and tender. That is pretty heavy for a smallish 060 tender engine. 
The Loco does have tender pickups, as you can see, although they appear to just go to the first two axles of the tender. The rear axle on the tender does not appear to have any pickups going to it. I don't know why, that's very strange. And sure enough, putting the contacts of a 9-volt battery onto those wheels produces no motion at all. So we've just got four pickups in the tender, but all of the driving wheels, as you can see, do have pickups on them. The Loco to tender drawbar is a far cry from the very innovative Dapple design. This is the more traditional screwed drawbar with the wires dangling underneath. Although, as you can see, there is some attempt to manage the wires and there's a little plug on the tender which allows the wires to be connected and disconnected. The removal of the base keeper plate is reasonably easy done. It's three screws on the base plus an extra hidden screw underneath the front coupling. The instructions didn't cover this, by the way. Removing the base keeper plate reveals the spring-loaded contacts which conduct the pickups. That's fantastic for maintenance, as always. And you do just have a single driven axle. On this example, it is just the rear axle. And as you can see, more importantly, there are proper turned metal bearings on every single driving axle. So even cheaper locos like this have them. Okay, so body removal is a little bit of a faff with this. You have to leave the frontmost screw undone that's underneath the front coupling. And then you just disconnect the drawbar and there are two screws located underneath the drawbar. Once those are out, you can lift the body out. Now here is the die cast chassis. It's quite neat and tidy. As you can see, there is some attempt to manage the wires, yes, yeah, so that they don't touch the flywheel. Now here is the motor. This is a cordless motor and in the past I used to kick off about cordless motors. Uh, but I have to say, as time's gone on and as I've seen cordless motors that actually do perform well, quality ones, I'm actually warming to them a little bit now. They're still not my favourite type because they're not compatible with every controller, namely feedback ones. But yeah, if it's a good quality cordless motor, I don't mind too much. And as you can see, this does have a flywheel fitted to it as well. How many super expensive locos from Backman and others have I looked at without flywheels? Well, Oxford have put one in there, so this ought to be a great running loco. And then the actual gear train is separated from the motor with a small drive shaft, which should help to reduce vibrations. And as you can see, that setup is quality as well with full metal bearings and everything. Very, very impressed by that. And then the gauging is absolutely fine. I measured 14.4 millimeters on each axle, except the middle one, which was 14.3, but that's not a problem. It's a little bit loose, should be absolutely fine. So here we are at the point of the performance test and the Loco still looks like a very appealing proposition, doesn't it? But there is still one more hurdle for this Loco and that is the performance itself. On paper, this ought to be a good runner, but we're about to find out whether it is in practice as well. So, first of all, does it actually work? Are you ready for this? It does. Oh, and did you hear that? It just purred into life. And this has not been running, folks. And I, I haven't tested the crawl yet, but already I can tell it's going to be a good one. £86.50 and straight out of the box. This is running better than I would say 80, 90% of the other locos I've tried. Oh man. Right, let's try this crawl then. Are you ready? I've backed it up a little bit. Let's see. Oh, oh, oh. A little bit of a jump. Oh my god. Well. On the one hand, it is incredibly slow and controlled, but I did just see it do a sudden jerk. But again, this could all go away with running in. Now though, look at it. Look at that crawl, wow. See what I mean, folks? This is why I get annoyed when super expensive models don't do good crawls. Because look at this one. <laughs> People say, why does a loco need to crawl like that? Well, the answer is, of course, it doesn't. But if a loco can, it just proves what quality mechanisms are inside. And I think when you pay hundreds of pounds for a model train, you need a quality mechanism. And the fact that you get one on this loco, even though it's like 85 quid, it's quite amazing. Look at that. That is really quite marvellous. It's really lovely. Let's put it to 50% speed. There you have it. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? Now watch this. I'm going to cut the power in front of you. Are you ready? Three, two, one, cut the power. Oh, it slows down beautifully. And I suppose that's because the coreless motor armatures have very low resistance on them, so that that flywheel is really able to just keep the mechanism going for a little while. Oh, folks, wow, beautiful. So, I mean, it's almost perfect, isn't it? I mean, if the crawl was a bit more consistent, 
it would be perfect right out of the box, which is almost unheard of. But it, it still has its running in period to come yet, so it might get better. But look at that. That's still pretty darn good, isn't it? Look at that. Wow. So I think Oxford Rail have done it again. I really think they have. Uh, let's see what the torque's like. I mean, it's blowing us away right out, right out of the box, so we might as well test every aspect of it. 50% speed. Look at that. So that's just a good comparison for the next time I get a Backman Loco that can barely turn its wheels. I think that's worth demonstrating, isn't it? <laughs> no slowdown at all, apparently, there. So the torque is fantastic. Shall we just cancel the rest of the review? Shall I just run this past the camera a thousand times for you? But seriously, might not have any valve gear, might not have any beautiful decorative lining on it, but seriously, I could watch this Loco run all day. Okay, but maybe I'm getting carried away because it hasn't attempted Gordon's Hill or any second radius curves or any curves at all for that matter. So I will set it to 50% speed and run it in. All right, fingers crossed, let's hope for the best. Well, would you know it, it's faultless. No slowdowns on the curves, no slowing down up Gordon's Hill, no derailments, perish the thought. Yeah, Oxford Rail really have cracked it. The first few Oxford Locos had a couple of silly design mistakes which stopped them running excellently. Then the N7 came along and that was pretty much perfect and this one has followed suit. I'm absolutely blown away by that. Oxford Rail, well done. Oh dear, <laughs> perhaps I spoke too soon. I just heard a nasty noise from this thing and it stopped moving, so I've got to investigate. Well, what was I just saying about silly design mistakes? I didn't think this Loco had any, and then at the last minute, it's proved that it does. It's the steps, unfortunately, not enough clearance between the steps and the coupling rods, and the coupling rods have come crack into contact with them, and that looks actually pretty nasty, doesn't it? So I'm gonna just push, oh, that was not nice. Okay, yeah, you can see how ridiculously close that coupling rod is running to the steps. But I've just made a different discovery. I've just noticed that this crank pin appears to have become unscrewed, which is obviously allowing the coupling rod to ride too close to the steps. So while it's unacceptable that crank pins should be working loose on a brand new model within a few laps, it's actually a very, very easy fix, hopefully, if I can just tighten this up. Although it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Okay, pretty sure the two mil is gonna be too small. Yeah, that's not gonna work, is it? I mean, I can sort of turn it. <laughs> I think I'm just gonna have to use some tweezers or some small pliers to do it. Ah, oh, I don't know, Oxford. Not only are the crank pins prone to coming loose, but they're a non-standard size. So I'm having to resort to great big pliers for tightening the <laughs> pin. So it's something like a 2.75 mil hex nut. I don't know, are the rest loose? Yeah, that one's loose. Oh, come on, man. Coupling rods, if they come loose, they can totally destroy a locomotive. It's really important that these are not leaving the factory loose. Is this one loose in the middle? They're all loose. What the hell? Yeah, I'm sorry, but this is so frustrating because it's so easy to get this right, and yet Oxford haven't. These are all loose. Now, are they fitted loose from the factory, or are they working loose as the loco runs? That's worrying. Well, motion has been resumed for the time being. I'm just seriously hoping that the motor didn't sustain any damage in the time it took me to cut power. Only time will tell. It seems all right now, though, doesn't it? So I'll have to watch this thing like a hawk as it runs in, I'll see you in an hour's time, hopefully with no more disappointing news. Well, wish me luck. Okay, folks, there we have it. Running in has concluded. And thank goodness that did go without an issue. The loco hasn't derailed, it hasn't cut out, and more importantly, the coupling rods haven't all jammed up and burnt out the loco, so that's really great. Uh, yeah, the performance has basically been faultless. It is quite a noisy runner, but only intermittently so. It's a bit strange. It can be running along and then suddenly it'll just start going eh, as though something's resonating in there. Maybe it's just a loose screw or something around the motor. But the performance doesn't change when it starts its funny noise, so I think it is just, you know, it's fine. But let's see if I can replicate that. You ready?
Yeah, it sounds like a sheep's coming, but uh, no, it's just the loco. Well, as you can see, the performance itself is absolutely beautiful, and it really is beautiful. Look at that, you just cut the power, it glides to a halt. Ah, it's just such a departure from locos that don't have decent flywheels. And even though it's a, you know, a cordless motor, and I'm not a huge fan of cordless motors, the performance really does speak for itself, doesn't it? And it's impossible to complain about the motor in this, really, because it is very, very good. Let's see what the crawl is like. Still good, still a good crawler? Let's see. Look at that. Crumbs. And this is on analog, by the way. Look at the control. I can speed up, I can slow down. Wow. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> I just can't believe it. It's just hilarious how the more expensive a model is, the worse it seems to perform. Because <laughs> seriously, it's mostly Oxford's locos that work the best. Yeah, it's really, really nice. I love it. What a good performer. Crikey. And I'm pleased to say that the pulling power is pretty good as well. So this has a tractive effort of 0.26 newtons, which should be around 18 coaches on straight and level track. And that's, you know, that's a little bit above what you'd normally expect from an 060 tender engine. So the pulling power is great. And that's because of the weight, you know, it's quite a weighty loco. So to test that, I've set up quite a formidable rake of wagons, actually. There are quite a lot there. There's probably going on 20. Seems quite a lot for a loco of this size, but they did haul long freight in real life, so maybe that's not unreasonable. Let's go couple, see how it handles a load. Okay, and this one's super easy to control, so I can just slow it down as it approaches. A little bit more, there we go. All right, and forwards we go. Let's see if it can haul them. Let's try it nice and slow, just to show off that torque. Keep giving it some, keep giving it some. Oh. Didn't like that too much. But there we go. It is a big rake. In fact, the way it did that was quite realistic in a way, wasn't it? And of course there is power there. You just have to turn it up. It does actually kick in at ridiculously low power on the controller. That was at sort of 20 it did that. And you know what? I have a feeling it's not going to struggle with those. Look at that. No problem at all. Okay, so on the middle line, I've got another 060 Tender Loco. It is a Hornby J15. Um, I think even this is probably more expensive, isn't it? Although it has been available pretty cheaply uh, in sales and such. That's another good Loco. More die cast on that one, but uh, overall similar sort of thing. Definitely similar sort of performance. And then on the inside line, we have the J36, which is another superb 060 Tender engine which, you know, just shows how spoilt we are for LNER 060s. Because nearly all of them are good quality, aren't they? Fantastic models. All right, let's check in with the 27, see how it's doing. Okay, here we go. What do you reckon? Is it going to stall on the curve? <laughs> Is it going to slow down to a crawl? I'd be surprised. It's, uh, it doesn't seem very phased, does it? Look at it. It looks so beautiful as well. I really do like the finish. Yeah, did that without any problem at all. So, minor issues aside, it looks as though Oxford Rail have done it again. It looks as though it's not a fluke. Oxford Rail do actually produce really, really good steam locomotives. And it just goes to show that good locos don't have to cost the earth. It isn't true that you need to spend £200 just to get the loco to look and work right because right here in front of us is a loco that's very well detailed, beautifully put together for the most part, very heavy, lots of die cast, an absolutely top notch mechanism with performance to match it. And above all, this thing cost me less than 90 pounds. Overall, I'm very, very pleased with this. Very pleased indeed. Well done Oxford Rail. What a beautiful loco. Probably one of my favorite 060 tender engines now. Love it. Let's have some ratings then for the overall very, very impressive J27 from Oxford Rail. So the level of detail, I mean, I wanted to give this a higher score, but there were one or two things that let it down. To be clear though, the level of detail is excellent. It's one of the best cabs I've seen. The finish is lovely, the decoration's excellent. Lots of detailing, valve gear between the frames. It's really, really good. I just don't like the wheels. I just, it's a pet hate of mine to see the shiny axles like that. 
mold the wheels so that they've got the realistic lathe centers or at least blacken the axles so that they're not distracting. The other thing is these sort of molding lines, the parting lines on the boilers, two of those on this model, not just one across the top, those were quite noticeable as well. So I have to try and reflect the model as closely as possible with my scores. So it is three and a half star on detail, but overall it's a great looking model. The performance then, I have to give this five stars. Now I'm not reflecting the breakdown in my performance category, that's coming up in quality later on, don't you worry. But the performance itself under normal circumstances is fantastic. Beautifully smooth, that flywheel just makes it such a joy to control. It's perfectly fine around curves and gradients, whatever you like. Really lovely and quiet and the crawl is superb. So five star performance. The tractive effort of 0.26 newtons is actually really quite good for a locomotive of this size. That equates to about 18 coaches on straight and level track, which is more than the Hornby Black 5. It's more than the Hornby Q6. And it's even more than the Hornby J36, which is an 060 tender engine, a bit like this, except that was a heavier loco than this. So yeah, go figure, it's quite powerful. The mechanism, similarly enough, is absolutely fantastic. Loads of pickups in both loco and tender. Very, very nice, serviceable, accessible mechanism. I like that a lot. You do have a coreless motor, which I'm not the hugest fan of, but blimey does it run well. And it also has a flywheel fitted to it. And don't forget the proper turned metal bearings on the axles as well. Mechanism, wonderful. Can't fault it, five stars. Quality then, now this was gonna be a five star, but it's had to come down two stars. And mainly this is for the loosely fitted parts, one of which, as we know too well, almost self-destructed the model. So we've got the chimney coming off, which needed repairing. I always knock a star off for that because I just don't think parts should be dropping off models, frankly. And then the crank pins. Now, one crank pin might come loose once in a while. It's very, very rare, actually, but okay, that might be just a one-off flaw, but actually most of the crank pins on this model were loose. And not only that, they've got a non-standard size of crank pin so that it's very difficult to tighten them back up again. So as the crank pin worked its way loose, the coupling rod was able to contact the steps and very, very nearly destroy the locomotive. So this is a very, very basic thing. It feels a bit mean knocking a star off for it, but come on. Key mechanical parts like that need to be correctly fitted, otherwise locos are gonna fail on people. Overall though, the quality's great. I mean, not a glue mark in sight, the decoration's nice and tidy, heavy die cast running plate, really beautiful quality mechanism and chassis. Yeah, it's a good quality loco. It, it pained me to knock off two stars, but I had to. Value for money though, I can't knock anything off here. So with an RRP of £109.95 and a typical retailer price of £86.50, this is an incredible value model. The standard of model that you get for not very much money is absolutely wonderful and it just goes to show how some other manufacturers do rip us off with their models. I mean, take Backman for example with their J11 locomotive. That's a very similar loco, similar size, similar level of detail, except on RRP that is £40 more expensive and it has a far poorer mechanism than this loco does. And that was a few years ago. I mean, we're talking before the virus with that one. Yeah, amazing value for money. Thank you very much, Oxford Rail, for actually making models that are accessible to the average person rather than making models that are far too expensive for anybody to enjoy and therefore turning people away from this marvellous hobby. So thank you Oxford for not milking your products for all they're worth. Thank you for making a reasonable amount of profit without fleecing us and thank you for giving us another beautiful model to run that does actually look and work so very nicely. Overall then, that's a very good score of 8.58 out of 10. Do you know what? This Loco is an all-rounder. It does nothing badly and it does quite a few things exceptionally well, the performance being one of them. Into the logbook it goes then, look at that. Fourth, above the Hornby Merchant Navy and below the Backman E4. And the sad thing is, if this had got five on quality, it would actually have been in first place for this year. So well done Oxford Rail, they've done it again. It's fantastic, it's not perfect. Please fix those crank pins, that's such an unnecessary problem. But overall, a beautiful model that works as it should. Well folks, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review as much as I did. Yeah, I mean, I had a feeling it would be good, but it's great to see that it actually is. Uh, but do comment down below, let me know what your experiences are. Have you got one of these? Have you got one ordered? Do check the crank pins though. If you only take one bit of advice from me ever, it is to check the crank pins. Just make sure they're nice and tight because there is a very good chance that you could shear through one of those very slim looking coupling rods if what happened to my model is at all typical of any other models. 
But that aside, it is running incredibly well and I've not had any issues since that uh, fateful moment. So fingers crossed everything is sorted now and fingers crossed I've got a loco that's going to last. That's the other good thing about Corus motors actually. They, they do seem to last a long time. They do maintain their performance, which is pretty good. So yeah, that was great. Loved it, really enjoyed the loco. Thank you, Oxford. Well done, Oxford. And let's hope Oxford are going to actually produce more locos in the future because I don't think they have any announced at the moment, do they? Please, Oxford, announce more because Oxford have proved that they're going to do a good job on them. And so, yeah, I trust them with more locos. <laughs> Well, I think we'll leave it there then. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, like I say. And I will see you very, very soon for some more videos. All right. Cheers, everybody. Take care.